Good morning. We're going to be continuing here in Jonah. As Jonah has gone through a storm, he's literally gone through a fish, and now he has been spit out onto dry land. And finally here, Jonah is going to obey the Lord and be faithful to the task that God has called him to. And again here, we see an, an emphasis on the power of God's grace and why God shows grace and the difference that makes in our lives for our own deliverance. So let's read here in Jonah chapter 3, uh, it's just 10 verses. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. And he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent, and turn from his fierce anger, so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Let's pray and thank the Lord for his word. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is truth. We thank you, Lord that your word reminds us of how you work, of your heart for us, of your desire for us, of why you have delivered us. Lord, may we not be a people that continues in that which you have saved us from, but a people eager to depend upon you, trust you, and obey you. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, here in chapter 3, everything has, in effect, been reset. Jonah comes out of this fish, disgorged on the dry land, an experience in and of itself that was probably pretty unique. I imagine it would have taken Jonah at least a few moments, if not several, to reorient himself with things like dry land that wasn't constantly moving, light, space, fresh air. But scripture wastes no time in telling us that the word of God came to Jonah again. And what God says this time is basically exactly what he said the first time. The call of God to Jonah hasn't changed one bit. There is no mention of God rebuking Jonah or adding any stipulations or difficulties or anything else to his command. Jonah certainly had taken quite the detour, and his heart and mind and body were literally in very different places from when he first heard the Lord. But despite what Jonah had experienced, God's will and desire for him had remained steadfast and unchanged. Jonah's earlier refusal had not surprised God nor deterred God one bit. He had decided that Jonah was the one he desired to complete this task, and nothing was going to change that. You see, in this story, as we have previously noted, it is easy to look at the Ninevites' repentance as the focal goal of the narrative. And although they certainly are central to the story, 
the way this story is written from a literary perspective, the focal point and the goal of this account isn't the repentance of the Ninevites, for they truly function as a subplot to the primary plot of Jonah's own repentance and spiritual development. It is as if God is saying to us in this account, yes, the task is important. The Ninevites need to hear this message. And God is saying, I will surely make, make sure they hear it. But my first concern is the condition of my servant's heart. You see, church, God is more concerned about his workers than he is about their work. Because ultimately, the work he has for us to do is his work to begin with. And he can certainly get it done without us. He elects to involve us simply for our benefit so that we can come to know and depend upon him in deeper and more thorough ways. For if the workers are where they need to be with the Lord, then the work will likewise be what it needs to be because God will be working through them. And throughout Jonah's time of rebellion, God was displeased with his servant. But he never once deserted him. It was God who controlled the storm, prepared that great fish, and rescued Jonah from the deep. This call that was given to Jonah really was more about God revealing something to Jonah than it was about the sin of the Ninevites. The Lord was going to address the Ninevites, but he chose to send Jonah to them for Jonah's benefit. You see, if there is something that God is trying to show us about himself, maybe some step of faith and obedience that the Lord desires for us to take, he will persistently and faithfully keep bringing just this same point up before us again and again and again until we yield to him and obey. As a pastor, I've seen this maybe most obviously with those who are continually hopping from one church to the next. And God, I've noticed, keeps bringing the same thing up at each church. But they don't like it. So they find something else about the church to blame, and then they head on to the next one, where God tries to get their attention on that same point again. And you might be there thinking, well, you know, <laughs> Pastor, that's not me. I'm sure if God was speaking to me or trying to show me something, I wouldn't miss it. I would get it. Uh, I'd obey. Brothers, sisters, we all will be amazed one day when we stand before the throne and realize all that God has done for us as he is sought to draw us closer to himself, and yet we simply missed it because we were more concerned about something, anything else. Yet again, what a gracious God we serve, that he would speak to us, that he would seek to reveal himself and make himself and his will known to us more than once. What incredible grace and patience God shows to each of us every day. Even as we persist in our sin, God continues to remind us of who he is and all that he has done for us, as well as all that he has set before us. And God spoke to Jonah again, and this time Jonah heard the word of the Lord and obeyed. And he set off for the city of Nineveh. And now the account finally actually addresses the people of Nineveh and how the Lord feels about them. At the end of verse 3, Scripture says there in the ESV, Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. But literally the Hebrew there says that Nineveh was very great to God. Meaning this statement isn't just about the city size, although it was a large city for that time, but that this city and all the people in it mattered to God. 
regardless of the wickedness that had defined the society, no matter of the evil that it had done, this city and its people mattered to God. Which this, this should be an encouragement to us. No matter what sort of drama may be taking place in our families, no matter what kind of dysfunction might be in our communities, no matter what evil may be in our nation, people matter to God, and He cares for them. And if God cares for us, then there is always the hope of the opportunity of His grace being shown to us. And you see, when Scripture says here that it was a three days journey in breath in reference to the city of Nineveh, that doesn't necessarily mean that one could walk through or around the city in anything less than three days. One could reasonably walk straight through it in less than a day. But what this is saying here is that for Jonah to effectively proclaim the message to all the people in this city, all the people whom God cared about, that took three days to get the word to everyone in and around the city of Nineveh. And it is also worth pointing out that more than likely, Jonah didn't just kind of wander into the city virtually unnoticed and then begin to scream, repent, at the top of his lungs. Jonah was coming as an official representative of the king of kings with a message commissioned from God himself. As an official foreign messenger, he probably would have sought city leaders to tell his story to and communicate the Lord's message. And although he may not have gotten an immediate direct audience with the king, he at least would have been able to share not only his message, but also his story with someone in an official role that could have then related everything to the king. In fact, in Luke chapter 11, verse 30, Jesus himself, speaking of this moment, declared, For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. Just as Jesus and what he had done communicated something to the Jews of his day, so what Jonah had been through was a sign to the Ninevites. You know, Jonah's story would have actually brought credibility to his message. In fact, many Bible scholars believe that Jonah's appearance would have come across rather dramatically to the Ninevites. His clothing was no doubt different from the norm. Not to mention the effect that being inside of a fish would have had on his clothing and body. It's even been pointed out that it is quite likely that the stomach fluids of the fish would have actually bleached not just his clothes, but even also his skin. The man could have been pale white. In fact, some have wondered if Jonah had not experienced you know, that time in the fish due to his rebellion and thus had this incredible testimony to share of how God had been gracious to him to go along with this message of judgment. Would the Ninevites have been so keen to respond in the same manner that they do here? We can't possibly answer that question. But there can be no doubt that Jonah's story, as well as his message, had a profound impact on this city and its leaders. It's as if God was in control, knowing all along what Jonah and the people of Nineveh would both need to recognize him for who he truly is and respond to him with true faith. And that is the beauty of our God. We might think God is just working over here, but he's also working over here and over here and over here and all around at the same time to accomplish his purposes in so many different people's lives. God is so much bigger than any one moment, one place, or one person. He cares about each one of us and is working to deliver all of us from the sin that so easily has entangled us. As you see here, where Jonah's message pointed out the people's reality of sin and the coming judgment, 
Jonah's story of how he got to Nineveh there by the grace of God would have also given these people hope in the midst of their sinful reality. I mean, if God had showed this kind of grace to his own rebellious prophet, maybe then if they truly repented, they must have wondered, God, God might show grace to us. You know, just think of what a difference a story of God's grace makes and what a difference it has made for us. Remember, we are all sinners, every single person. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Scripture says. And Scripture is clear, the wages of sin is death. We all deserve death, not just physical death, but well, unending death, permanent death and judgment. But we have hope of knowing that God has made a way of grace and that this grace is sure through the fact that Jesus came, that he died on the cross, that he was dead for three days and then rose again, a sign, as he said, far greater than that of Jonah. We know that God loves us and desires to save us because he did not spare his own son in bringing this grace and salvation to us. And thus, likewise, as we come to know him, we have our own testimonies of God's grace to us in our salvation and in all of God's faithfulness from that point on afterwards. Just consider the impact of knowing their reality along with this testimony of God's grace through Jonah and how that impacted the Ninevites. The king of the Ninevites repented, tearing his clothes in anguish and immediately declaring a time of fasting and prayer and repentance. The entire demeanor of the city was radically transformed in a manner that was and is truly unprecedented. And notice what the king says in verse 9. He said, you know, who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Do not miss the incredible weight of that sentence. This king felt both the burden of their sin before the Lord as well as the opportunity for grace. And like we talked about last week, it is God's grace that leads us towards repentance. If the king and the people have no chance of grace, then why change? Why repent? But if they know that Jonah's God is a gracious God who desires to show compassion, then they have every possible reason to humble themselves and repent. And God took notice of their repentance, meaning this just wasn't some sort of ruse to convince Jonah or try and trick God. The people truly acknowledged their sin and repented of it. In fact, Jesus himself commended the true nature of their repentance, and said that on the day of judgment, the very people of Nineveh would judge the people of Jesus' day. When Jesus said in Luke 11, 32, the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something far greater than Jonah is here. Jesus himself acknowledged the Ninevites' true repentance and in turn called out all those who have a far greater message and messenger than Jonah. And yet, do not likewise acknowledge their sin and choose to trust God's grace and repent. You see, realize, it's not that the Ninevites suddenly became the most perfect society of peace and happiness and gentleness. In fact, God had already prophetically declared through another prophet that one day the Assyrians would be destroyed. And we see Nineveh's prophetic destruction actually come about just a few generations later through another often missed minor biblical prophet named Nahum. So all of their society was not entirely reformed. And it does not seem that the truths learned here by the Ninevites were effectively transferred to the future generations that came after them. But 
a great number in that day in that city truly did repent and change their ways, even if there were those around them and after them who ultimately returned to their sin. But you know, we'll see next week that Jonah still had a long way to go himself, that even he, after all he had experienced, still did not truly understand or fully appreciate God's grace. The point being here is that when it comes down to it, when it comes down to the end of all things, and each of us are standing before the Lord of glory on Judgment Day, there will only be two types of people. Those who have recognized God's grace and responded to God's grace with repentance, and those who have rejected God's grace and have refused to repent. And those who have not repented will spend eternity in the reality of judgment, which all of us in sin deserve. But those who have responded to God's grace with repentance will experience a deliverance so great and so complete from sin that it is beyond our finite ability to comprehend. You see, this is the deliverance which God seeks for us. It is not just a deliverance from judgment, for judgment and death are but both the natural byproducts and results of sin. It's what sin has to bring by the very nature of sin. Sin separates us from God. Sin says, I don't need the author and giver of life. And when we are severed from our source of life, death is inevitable. But God doesn't show us grace just simply to save us from the consequences of our sinful actions, thoughts, and desires, but to deliver us from sin itself. It's not just about avoiding consequences. It's about being changed and made new, that we would belong to God and be holy unto Him, as Scripture says. God shows us such incredible grace and so that we might truly be delivered from sin in every way. God didn't just care about the city of Nineveh because of the sheer number of people within its walls. He cared about Nineveh because he cared about each and every individual person within it who was trapped in a life of sin that literally was destroying their souls from the inside out separating themselves from the God of life who had made them and who loved them. Go back there to Luke chapter 11, that verse we looked at just a moment ago, verse 32. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. What a message and messenger of grace have we received in Jesus? The question is, are we simply content to know that judgment has been addressed? Or are we going to recognize that God has shown us such grace so that we might repent and experience deliverance from sin? God has not delivered us from judgment just so that we can accomplish tasks or works of service or do churchy things. We have been delivered so that we would be free from sin, that sin would no longer define who we are, but that we would be drawn closer and closer to God, the author and giver of life, the one who has saved us that we would be His in a more thorough and deeper way than we could ever imagine. You know, we won't know that complete and perfect freedom from the temptation of sin this side of heaven. But when we are obedient to what God has laid before us right now, in response to His grace, then we can know true deliverance from sin in that area of our lives as we walk closer with the Lord in obedience and faith. The Ninevites repented because they believed the Lord's message of judgment and grace. 
Thus they experience God's deliverance not only in their day, but in eternity, Jesus says. And God's deliverance isn't about just avoiding judgment or even hardship, but about setting us free from the worst thing of all, sin, so that we can be drawn close to our God and know Him in a true, complete, and deep way. Do you desire to know the Lord this way? To be free from sin? Is there an area of sin that the Lord might desire to deliver you from today? Something in your life, in your heart, in your mind that has just gotten gotten in the way of you drawing close to the Lord. Where do you need to respond to His grace? Remembering His graciousness and repent of that, leaving it behind. Will you see a yes to the hand of grace? that God has extended towards you in Christ? Will you leave sin behind? In your service, are you depending on your own strength? Are you focused so much on the work you've missed, who God is, what He has called us to, and how gracious He has been to you? God wants us to know Him and to know Him more and more and more. Is your heart's desire to draw closer and closer to Him? Or is there something getting in the way of you responding to God's grace? God desires to deliver us. Don't ignore what God desires to do in your heart and your mind. Respond to Him today. Let's pray. Lord, thank You. Thank you that you have shown us such grace to deliver us from sin, that we would be yours, that sin would not define us, wouldn't lead us, wouldn't guide us, but that you would, Lord, that we would know you and your presence with us in a very real and mighty way. Lord, I I pray today uh, for each person listening to this right now, if there is something in their life that is keeping them from you, something in their mind, some attitude, some perspective in their heart, maybe it's a matter of pride. Maybe it's it's a habit or some other temptation, Lord. I pray, Lord, that they would recognize your great grace to them today, that they would turn from it, renouncing it, confessing it, repenting of it, Lord, I pray that you would put within their heart a strong desire, a new desire to draw closer to you, to be yours. Remind us today not only of how much we need you, but of all that you have done to deliver us from sin and draw us to yourself. Thank you, God, for loving us so much. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Go in the grace and peace of Christ, and don't let anything keep you from drawing close to your Lord this week.